Oops. <laughs> I'm late. Oh my goodness. Hold on just a second. Okay. Hello, friends. Welcome to Chickenlandia and welcome to Bok Talk, your 100% friendly backyard chickens show. I am your host, Dahlia, also known as the president of Chickenlandia. I'm a backyard chicken educator that has found peace and joy in the chicken yarn, and it is my mission to help you find that too. Okay, welcome back. <laughs> welcome back. I was like watching YouTube videos. I wasn't even paying attention to the time. <laughs> so I was a little bit late, but anyway, I'm here. Um, I'm only one. I was like seconds late. All right. Uh, today is episode 12 of season five. We are going to talk about something that I'm very passionate about, and that is keeping chickens in a smaller space, no matter where you are, okay? I am all about that. I'm all about more people keeping chickens. I just feel really strongly that everybody has the right to keep chickens, and we're going to talk about how to make that possible, okay? Um, I do have a question that was submitted through my website, welcome to chickenlandia.com. I'm going to chat for a little bit. I'm going to answer that question that was submitted through my website, and then I will open up the chat here live on YouTube for some questions. If you want to submit a question to Bok Talk, all you have to do is go to welcometochickenlandia.com, go to the contact section, and you're going to see where you can sign up for my mailing list. Well, you can see, you'll see where you can submit a question to Bok Talk. And you will also be asked if you want to sign up for my mailing list, which I really think you should do because you will get a coupon for my online course. It's called Backyard Chickens 101, a chicken course for everyone. It's a super fun interactive course. You get direct access to me. I answer your questions, all that stuff. Um, so I'm super proud of it. So you guys should check that out for sure. I also want to let you guys know very quickly that I am going to be doing a live webinar this Wednesday. So today, when I'm recording this, it's the 12th. Um, the live webinar is Wednesday, and it is in partnership with my friends at Mother Earth, Earth News, and it's called Love Your Chicks, and it's free, okay? So if you're listening to this in podcast form, Wednesday has already passed. We've already had Valentine's Day. I've already done the webinar, but you can still listen to it. Um, I, I will leave a link in, you can, you can still watch it and listen to it. I will leave a link in the show notes for you so that you can learn about where you can watch it, all that stuff. Um, and if you're watching this before the webinar, you can go to that link and you can set a reminder and all this stuff. So anyway, it's called Love Your Chicks. It's about avoiding issues with baby chicks. And I really am going to be like getting into it in this free webinar. I'm super excited about it. So I hope I see you there. Okay. I want to say hello to some of the people in the chat. Patty's here. Joy is here. Hello, Bethy. Laura. Whitney's here. Darlene. Samantha. Kay. Davis. Steel, howdy, howdy. I'm from Texas. I'm from Duncanville, Texas. Uh, let's see. Amanda's here. Jill, Holly, Peace of My Heart Homestead is here. Yay, Jana. Potato, bok bok. <laughs> I'm sorry. I hope I didn't miss anybody, but hello. Thank you so much for being here. All right, let's get started. Um, I, I want to start out by saying something that I've said many times before. Uh, every single person that decides to keep chickens, whether they're doing it in the country, in the suburbs, or the city, I really feel like they're doing something that is very important, not just for themselves as individuals, not just for their own families, but really for the world. I do believe that. Um, you know, when I first got chickens... I had no idea how much they would change my life. <laughs> I, did, I did not know that I was going to be doing what I'm doing right now. Okay. <laughs> um, but I really am a, I'm a better person and I'm a happier person. I'm a healthier person now that, you know, that I've had this experience. 
Um, so I really feel like I want to see everybody have access to this experience. Um, whether or not they have them for just for pets, whether or not they have them just for eggs or for both. I just think it's really important for everybody to be able to experience this for so many reasons, you know. Um, so I want to start out by acknowledging that one thing that I don't think anyone can really deny is that the optimal living arrangement for chickens is on pasture, you know, on, on like some big piece of land on pasture out in the country. We know that studies have shown that, you know, chickens that are raised on pasture, they lay healthier eggs. And I think it's very safe to assume that they also are going to have a really good quality of life possibly better than what they would have if they were raised on a small plot of land. Now I say this having come, you know, when I first had chickens, I was in the suburbs. My chickens were in a, in a pretty, you know, much smaller space than they are now. So, but I still think it's reasonable to concede that, that chickens raised on pasture are just going to do better. They're going to have a better quality of life. And I'm just, I'm all about telling the truth so that we can, we can face it and deal with it. Okay. You know, when I, when I look at the truth of it, I also feel like we have to look at the reality that we're living in. And that is that not everyone can live in the country. Not everyone has a big plot of land. Not everyone can go out and buy a big plot of land. That's just not going to happen for a lot of people. I think most of us have to make do with the cards that were dealt. Um, and of course, many of us, even if we could, you know, there's a lot of people out there that even if they could live in the city, they, they don't want to, they want to live. They, I mean, even if they could live in the country, they don't want to, they want to live in the city. And I don't blame them. I was a city girl for a very long time. Um, am I buffering? Am I buffering? Let me know. Is it very, it, let me know how the, uh, how it's coming through. Okay. In the comments. So, so, okay. We know that the chickens, so we know, hold on. I got, I got, I got, I got, I got all mixed up there. Let me, let me find my place. Oh, someone says I live in the forest. <laughs> that's, that's a beautiful area to live in too. Um, so with that in mind, that not everybody can live on this big piece of land, we know that chickens raised on pasture lay healthier eggs, mainly because they have access to fresh vegetation and they have constant exposure to beneficial microorganisms in the soil and in the air. But that doesn't mean that chickens that live in, you know, in smaller spaces are doomed. Okay. I don't want you to feel that way. Um, in the absence of nutrient rich pasture, there are a few things that we can do to make sure that our chickens get some fresh nutrients in their diet in a similar way that, than, that they would if they were living on pasture. Okay. One thing I always say is that because of the high nutritional requirements that modern laying hens have, we know they have that. That's just how they've been bred. Um, it is really the best case scenario. It's not the only, it's not the only scenario that is, that is appropriate, but it's the best case scenario for them to be on the highest quality chicken feed that you can afford. Okay. Lots of people don't use chicken feed at all. Okay. And that is still a valid way to feed chickens. But I do say that because of laying hens, you know, especially the production breeds, because of their very high nutritional needs. It's best to have like their base layer be a good quality, as good as you can afford uh, layer feed. Okay. But remember that most chicken feed is processed. So what, you know, if you go out and go to the feed store, most of what you see is going to be processed chicken feed. It's going to be in pellets or crumble, but it will be processed. And that means that some of the nutrients during that processing is lost and had to, has to be added back in, you know, in a kind of an unnatural way after product, after it is exposed to high heat. Okay. So for this reason, 
I think it is a great idea, especially if your chickens do not have access to green pasture, to give your chickens healthy, healthy kitchen scraps like leafy greens, other kinds of vegetables, low sugar fruits, sprouts, fodder, um, which I'm going to be talking about here in a minute, to ensure that your chickens, you know, they'll, they'll get what they need from their feed and they'll also be getting fresh nutrients. And it will, and then the bonus is that it will help you to manage waste in your home as well, which is how our relationship with the chicken has been for thousands of years. And I really want to see more of that come back because it's just this perfect symbiotic relationship and it is beneficial to both you and your chickens and the planet and your community and all that. Okay. So I mentioned, uh, sprouts and fodder. This is going to be another way to get fresh nutrient dense vegetation into your chickens. Okay. Sprouts can be grown very easily. I grow them in a jar and I have a video all about it. I'll link that in the show notes for you. I grow it in the jar and I take it out to them and it's like little clumps. After it grows a couple of inches, I'll take it out to them. And the chickens absolutely love it. And it's so good for them. And the other thing that you can do is you can create chicken salad bars in your run. Okay. And I I have a video about that too. I'll I'll link that in the show notes too. Um, If you've watched my videos, you've probably seen the salad bars. It's basically like I just have these two small raised beds and then I have hardware mesh over the beds. They're like stapled over the beds. So I will plant things in in the raised bed and then it grows up through the hardware mesh. So the plants don't get eaten. They don't get eaten. (laughs) The plants don't get eaten. Um before they even get a chance to grow, okay? So um, someone asked, what is fodder? And I will tell you, like, there's sprouts. It's just another um, point in the growing process. So when you have the sprouts, like, it's just growing out of the jar, it's sprouted. If you were to let that grow to a certain length, at some point it becomes fodder. And certainly if you grow it in the ground, it becomes fodder, okay? Um, So it's think of it as, like, sprouts versus, like, what looks like grass. Okay. I hope I'm, I'm, I am, uh, it's just a different stage of growth. Okay. Um, so the cool thing about it is that you can do this right in your chicken yard and because of the wire top, the chickens can't destroy or eat the seedlings before they can grow. You can do it with just like a regular pot. Like if you have a big wooden pot, you can do it. You can do it with another plant container. Um, Just cover it with hardware mesh or even with chicken wire. And then it will grow up and your chickens have access to fresh greens without having access to pasture. So I call that like pasture raised without the pasture. (laughs) Okay. Even though it's technically not pasture, you know, there's definitely benefits to that. But it is one way to give them some of the things that they might be missing, you know, living in a small space where they've likely destroyed any bit of vegetation they could get their their little feet on uh, in a very short period of time. Because if you you know if you have chickens in a small space, they turn it into dirt. You know, <laughs> even if it was like all grass, it just becomes dirt. Okay, and this is a way to give them some fresh nutrients, some some fresh uh, vegetation. So I want to move on to a question that I received through my website, welcome to chickenlandia.com, because I feel like it's it's a bit relevant to to today's subject. And this is from Melissa. Hold on. That was like the slowest drink ever. <laughs> I am going to answer questions. You know, after I'm done with this, I'll start answering questions. You can write them in all caps. But I just want to get through everything I'm going to get through. And then I'll start answering questions um, from those of you that are in the chat. Okay? Okay. From Melissa. 
Hi, we have a chicken coop that homes 10 hens and a rooster. It says it can home up to 15 if I'm remembering correctly. If I want to add more hens to our backyard chicken family, would I need to get a bigger coop for them all? Or is there a way to incorporate in, incorporate two coops in one huge chicken yard? Would they be too confused with two options for roosting homes, nesting boxes, etc.? Just wondering in the future, if I want 30 chickens, <laughs> I can just hear the the chicken math happening, <laughs> the wheels turning. Um, if I want 30 chickens, does that mean I'd have to have one big chicken coop? By the way, mine free range within a huge part of a yard that is fenced off. Okay, so uh, first off, and, and this doesn't sound like it is relevant to you, Melissa, but I want to mention it because of the subject that we're talking about today. When you have a flock in a smaller space, it is very important to make sure that you aren't getting, that your chickens are not getting stressed out from lack of space, okay? Melissa, your chickens sound like they have a lot of space, but I'm just saying this because I want everybody to understand how important that is. Please do not overcrowd. No matter how tempting it is, when you have chickens on a smaller lot, you really have to be extra mindful about not succumbing to the told chicken math thing. And I know it's hard. <laughs> okay, I totally know it's hard. But in general, you will want two to four square speed of feed. <laughs> in general, you will want two to four square feet of space per standard size chicken in the coop. Okay, and I let me just explain something because sometimes people will be like, two square feet, that's not enough. You can get away with that limited amount of space in the coop if you have other areas in your chicken yard where your chickens can get out of the elements. If the only place your chickens have to get out of the elements within your chicken yard is their coop, you need to have at least four square feet of space per standard size chicken within that coop. Okay, of course... Bigger is bigger is better. If you can have more than that, that would be great. But in general, I just say I re my recommendation is two to four square feet of space, depending on how much space they have to get out of the elements outside of their coop. Because some chickens, like, they only go in their coop to roost. It's basically just roosting bars and nesting boxes, and that is their coop. There's not even really, like, a floor for them to peck and scratch on, Okay which is fine, but you really, if that is your situation, you really want to have other areas in the chicken yard where they can hang out and be out of the elements, whether you're in a place where it gets hot or whether you're, you're in a place where it gets cold. Okay. And make sure that within the space, oh, and also, um, before I forget, 10 square feet of space per standard size chicken, chicken within the run. Okay. And make sure that you are providing them with enough enrichment within their space. And that can be like dust baths. You can hang a cabbage, uh, you know, or you can just put a cabbage on a Frisbee and put it in there or on a plate and put it in there, um, like half it and put it in there. Um, additional perches, if you can have additional perches, put them in the chicken yard. Random branches, tree stumps, leaves from your yard that they can peck and scratch through. There are just so many things in the natural environment that are free that can enrich your chicken's lives. But you want to make sure that they have things to occupy them, especially like the smaller the space, the more enrichment you need. Okay? Um, but to answer your question, Melissa, yes, you can have two coops within your yard. What you need to do is if you have your, your new flock of chickens, let's say you have your new flock, you have a, a new coop within the chicken yard and you want them to roost in that one coop, then make sure that they are living within that coop for a little while. Or if that coop has an attached run with it, you just want them to be confined to that space for, you know, a, a week or two so that they know that that's where they're supposed to live. And they'll start to think, okay, this is where I, I sleep at night. So this is that's naturally where they're going to go. Okay. Of course, you will need to figure out how to do a process of integration when you have new chickens. Um, 
but if your coop has a, you know, if it's a coop with a, a little run attached to it, um, it's super easy to do integration because your chickens are going to see the new chickens within their bigger run. They're going to be around there. They're going to see them. They're going to have a chance to get used to them. Okay. And for more about integrating new chickens into your flock, I'll leave a link in the show notes. But yes, you can absolutely have two coops. You don't need to like get rid of your old coop and build some huge coop. You can have two coops. Just, you know, be mindful about getting which ones you want to sleep in a certain coop. They need to be confined to that, either to that coop, if there's enough space, or to that coop with the attached run for a little while so that they know that that's their home. Okay? So I hope that helps, Melissa. Um, and thank you so much for your question. Okay, I am about to open up the chat for questions. But before I move on, I need to make two announcements because my friends, I still have to pay those chicken bills. <laughs> I still do. <laughs> the more I do, the more feed they want. You know, the more work I get, the more feed they want, <laughs> the more grubs they want. <laughs> they're trying to peck me out of, <laughs> they're trying to peck and scratch me out of house and home. <laughs> Okay, so I need to let you know that as always, this podcast was brought to you by the folks at My Favorite Chicken. My Favorite Chicken is my favorite online shop to get my feed. I get my non-GMO, organic, and socially responsible scratch and peck feed from My Favorite Chicken. I get my chicken supplies. I get all my fun chicken stuff, my apron, my purse. <laughs> Um, I get fun chicken treats like the chicken fun do all of this is at my favorite chicken. And I will leave that link for you in the show notes. This podcast was also brought to you by the folks at small pet select small pet select is a small local company to me, but they have an online store that I know you guys are going to love. Um, I'm using a few of their products right now. I'm using the pea flakes. Uh, that is a great source of protein for the chickens. I have used their grubs. I, what else? I have used their shavings. And then we talked about growing sprouts for chickens. They have like these little bags called pet greens and the sprouts grow up in this little bag and there's, it's so easy to grow sprouts that way. And you can just like cut the top off and keep growing them. So anyway, I love that product. I'm always talking about it. You can check these products out and their other chicken products and their products for furry little animals because they have stuff for like rabbits and chinchillas and hamsters and stuff. Okay. I will leave a link for you in the show notes and I'll leave a coupon code for you. So definitely check it out. Okay. Now I am going to open up the chat for questions. Did the Chickenlandia presidential advisor come in? She may not have been able to come in yet. Um, please write your question in, in all caps so that I can see it with these progressive lenses. <laughs> because I'm progressively getting older. Okay. <laughs> all right, hold on. Oops. Tessa asks, have you ever lived in Pennsylvania? My boyfriend swears he heard you say you lived in Pennsylvania before. I think he's crazy, but I'd like to put the issue to rest. I'm sorry, Tessa, but yes, I lived in Franklin, Pennsylvania. Uh, I was there not for very long, less than a year. Um, and yeah, uh, it was beautiful. A beautiful area. Um, if I had to move back to Pennsylvania, it probably wouldn't be back to Franklin. Uh, nothing against Franklin, <laughs> but I had an awful job when I lived there. And, uh, so yeah, not really trying to go back there, but I love Pittsburgh, love Philadelphia. Um, and it's beautiful. Gosh, in the, in the fall, it's so beautiful. So yes, I did live in Pennsylvania your boyfriend isn't crazy. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, Jennifer asks, uh, do you know what it means when your eggs have a weak spot or wavy eggs? So it could, it could really be nothing. You know, there's a lot of variation, especially when chickens start when they're new layers or when they've taken a break and they're starting to lay again, you can see some abnormalities. Um, or if they're the older they get, the more abnormalities you're going to see. So the thinner their eggshells are going to get, you know, they could get wavy or whatever, just kind of look a little different, um, with like calcium deposits and stuff. I, I wouldn't worry about it unless it really started to happen. It, like it's a chronic thing and you notice like the same chicken is laying, laying these odd eggs over and over again. Um, sometimes a, like a wrinkly egg like that can indicate something like some kind of respiratory issue that might be going on in your flock, but I certainly would not jump to that immediately. Um, it could also be a vitamin deficiency. I wouldn't jump to that immediately. I would just make sure that you're giving them, you know, some really good nutrition, Make sure you've got them on some type of calcium supplement that could be oyster shell, it could be limestone, it could be their eggs crushed up, you know, their eggshells crushed up and given back to them. If you're doing the eggshell thing, you want to replenish the calcium from an outside source every once in a while, okay? Um, but yeah, it doesn't necessarily mean something bad, but I would keep an eye on it. And certainly if you see a chicken that's looking a little bit lethargic or whatever, struggling to lay. Those are things that you want to keep an eye out on, but I wouldn't panic about it just yet. Uh, so rooted and grounded in life asks, I have four chicks born January 11th. Congratulations. Um, three are growing. One is still small. We started wetting the chick feed and she's eating. Do you think this will help her grow or is something wrong? I'm not aware. You know, with any animal, there's the chance that one will be smaller. You know, one is not thriving quite as much as the others. Um, of course, there's like the average size of a chick and then there's going to be chicks that are all across that spectrum of, of what is considered normal. You know, a chick that's really small, if they're, if you notice that they're just not thriving, that's when I would get concerned about it. If she's eating, that's a really good sign. You know, if wetting the food is helping her to eat, I would continue to do that and just make sure that you're cleaning it up and then, you know, it's not turning into a big mess in the brooder. Um, it is possible that something's wrong. I really could, I can't make that diagnosis. I don't know for sure if something's going on with her. Um, but like I said, if she's eating, then that's a good sign. If wetting the food down is making her eat more, I would continue to do that because I do think that would help her to grow. If it, you know, it, it could be that she's just a runt and she's just not getting to the food as much as the others are getting to. Um, and so that, that would be a plus that she's, she's able to get to the food and you're starting to be mindful of that and make sure she gets enough and you're making sure she's getting enough to eat. Also make sure that, you know, is she a bantam? Like, cause sometimes people will get a batch of chicks and they won't realize one of them's a bantam and the, that chick is really small. <laughs> so you might want to see, you know, like, oh, well the, you look into what breed she is or whatever. Um, maybe ask the people that you got her from and, and figure out if it could possibly be that she's a bantam chicken. But I hope that helps. Uh, Gina asks, my chickens stay out in the rain all day when they have covered areas. <laughs> oh gosh, these chickens. <laughs> okay, <laughs> my chickens stay out in the rain all day when they have covered areas to get in. Should I be concerned about them being so wet when they go to roost? I it depends on the 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 conditions where you are, you know, the the temperature where you are. I wouldn't worry about it because obviously if it's raining, it's above freezing and chickens can really handle cold, you know. And and also like even if they're wet, like they look wet underneath, they have so such thick feathers 
that underneath they might not be, you know, it's, it's not like this really dangerous situation and they're, they're not like chilled to the bone because their feathers are so thick that they're not that cold and they're not that wet. Um, I think chickens in general know what they can handle. If they, if it's really raining hard, usually they'll just be like, no, I'm going to stay in the covered area. But if it's raining a little bit, they might be out pecking and scratching and that's good. You know, you want them to be out there um, pecking and scratching and foraging and looking for things and being active uh, more than they are stuck underneath something and just waiting for the weather to get better. So I wouldn't worry about it too much. Um, you know, if you have a chicken that's looking like it's not doing too well, like it's struggling a little bit, you could bring that chicken um, in the garage or whatever uh, for that time and um, but and then let them back out in the morning. But I honestly, I wouldn't worry about it too much. You know, my chickens, like sometimes they'll be out in the rain, sometimes they're not. And it's it's really not a problem is it? it becomes a problem if it was freezing outside and, you know, below, way below, uh, pretty below freezing. And then it's like, okay, but it's not raining. If that's happening, it's, it's usually snowing. <laughs> so I wouldn't worry about it. Uh, Jana asks me, do you have lavender Orpingtons? I do not. I used to have a lavender Moran. And she was very beautiful. And I do have a lavender Danver. And she's very beautiful. But I do, I've, ne I've never had a lavender Orpington. Hi, Mimsy's Garden. Thank you for being here. Okay. Oh, Susie Floozy says, I lost my little death layer squatch Friday just before dawn. She had two weeks to live, but made it to day 113. Wow. I'm so proud of her. I love her. I'm so sorry, Susie. She was a lucky little chicken. So I, I'm so glad that she was with you and I'm sorry that you lost her. Okay. I am going to answer one more question, but before I do that, I want to remind all of you that my book... <laughs> is available to order. You can go on Amazon. You can go to Barnes and Nobles. You can go to Powell's. You can hopefully go to your local bookstore and they will have it. If they don't have it, tell them to order it for you. Um, this is my book. It's called Let's All Keep Chickens, The Down-to-Earth Guide to Natural Practices for Healthier Birds in a Happier World. It's really one of the best things I've ever done, you know, besides like marrying my husband and giving birth to my children. <laughs> Um, it's like a baby. It really is. This is like giving birth. <laughs> Believe me, it's just as difficult. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, definitely please check it out. I'll leave a link for you in the show notes. And thank you so much to those of you that have already purchased it. Okay. You know what? I'll answer two more questions because <laughs> it's only 533. All right. Um, should I be worried that my rooster might mate with his sisters? <laughs> you know, those roosters will just do anything. <laughs> um, I wouldn't worry too much about it initially. Um, there is like, I mean, it happens in the chicken world. It's actually called line breeding. There's people that just, you know, they're, they're breeding within, within a flock and it does, that does happen. You know, chickens don't have those same instincts that humans do. Um, so I would say that, and I am not a breeding specialist. I, that is not my arena. Um, the Chickenlandia presidential advisor is a, is a chicken breeder and she's super knowledgeable about that, but I don't think she's in the chat. Maybe she is. Um, if you are, please answer this question, <laughs> but I would be mindful of it. And then at some point you will want to add more, you know, different stock to, to your flock. Okay. You might put a different rooster in there, um, just to you really, because you don't want, you want to avoid genetic issues. Um, 
but certainly it's not something that's un- unheard of. A lot of people do that and I wouldn't be like really concerned about it. And certainly if you're not, if you are a breeder and then I would, you know, then you would want to add a different rooster at some point. Okay. But, uh, just if you have like a barnyard flock, I wouldn't worry about it. I don't think that you're going to get like abnormalities or anything like that. In fact, you know, Bubblicious is one of his girlfriends is his daughter. <laughs> it's just like, <laughs> like to us, it's like, oh my gosh. But to them, like they, you know, they just, like I said, they have different instincts. Um, What if there is a chicken? Okay, so someone asks, what if there is a chicken being aggressive but loves one chicken and can't be taken away from her. Okay. I'm not completely sure what that means. Um, I am assuming maybe it's like a rooster that's being overly, like that's over mating a hen. In that case, you can put a saddle on the hen, but I would, if they're being really aggressive and they're hurting each other, certainly if blood is being drawn, it doesn't really matter how much, they want to be with that other chicken. They should probably be separated at least for a little while because you want them to get out of that. That's a, that's like a, a compulsion, you know, it's like a habit that they've gotten into for whatever reason. Um, make sure that they have enough, um, enrichment, make sure that they're not getting bored, make sure that they're not overcrowded, but you may want to re- remove the aggressor for a little while, remove them from the flock, you know, put them somewhere where they can be safe, where they have food and water, but they're away from the flock because they need to go down the pecking order a little bit, okay, so that they're not being aggressive to another chicken. Um, but I wouldn't be concerned with how much they love that other chicken if they're hurting that other chicken, okay? All right, now I am going to answer just one more question. Um, is it possible to give my kids, I assume you mean your chickens, (laughs) too many fruits and veggies? I feed mine daily along with scratch and peck feed. I love your show and all the advice. You're the best. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much, Janelle. Okay, so in Chickenlandia, we have something called the Chickenlandia Chicken Food Pyramid. And I talk about it all the time. I talk about it in my book. I talk about it in my course. And very basically what it is is it's like, it looks like the food pyramid that, that we had in the (laughs) eighties, but it is much better and it's for chickens. So if you can imagine like a triangle and then it has three tiers. Okay. The bottom tier is your feed and you're feeding a very high quality feed. uh, Scratch and peck feed is the, I believe the best quality feed you can buy in the US, like I don't know of another feed that I think is better than that feed. Um, So that would be your bottom tier. That's the main thing you want them to eat. That that is what you want them to have as the bulk of their diet, okay? Now again, I'm speaking best case scenario here. Everybody's situation is different. The second tier is the fruits and veggies, okay? So uh, leafy greens, low sugar fruits, um, sprouts, fodder, all of that goes into the second tier. And then on the top tier, you've got treats like grubs, mealworms, scrambled eggs, um, shrimp tails, um, whatever else that you're feeding them as a treat. Okay. Cracked corn would go in that too. So that's how I want you to think of it. I don't want you to think of it as, you know, I need to measure everything that I give them and I, they can only have one spoonful of this. That is not how our ancestors did it. It is not a a way to feel less stressed out in the chicken yard. In fact, you will, it's futile. Like you will really be kind of running circles around yourself if you do that. It's better to think of it just as something that you, something that's balanced. You want them to have a balanced diet and you think of your own diet you know, oh, I need to eat vegetables every day. I need to have, you know, that needs to be the bulk of what I eat. I need, I need to have protein every day. And that's how I want you to think about feeding your chickens. You keep the balance, you keep the, 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 you know, the chicken food pyramid in your head. And eventually it just becomes second nature. 
Okay, so I would say it's likely you're not giving them too much fruits and veggies. What you can do is like give them the bulk of their feed. Like for instance, I ferment my chicken's feed. They get the bulk of their feed in the morning because that's when they give them their fermented feed. And then by the afternoon, it's usually gone. That's when they would get their scraps. And then after that, or, you know, in the, in the morning, I might give them a little bit of treats. If it's the winter, I might give them a little bit of treats before they go to bed. But everything is cleaned up in the chicken yard before they go to sleep, okay? Unless you have like a rat-proof compost area. All right? Otherwise, you're going to get rodents. So that's what I do. That's how I keep it balanced. That's how I keep from stressing out and worrying about, oh, you know, am I giving them too much of this? Am I giving them too much of that? Just think of it in terms of is their diet balanced? And you make sure they have enough space so that they can peck and scratch. They have lots of enrichment so that their exercise, chickens will literally exercise all day long. They're always moving. You know, even when they're still, they seem to be like moving a little bit. Okay. So that's what you want. And, um, I think it's very likely you're doing great. Okay. (laughs) All right, guys, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you to my moderator and co-producer Kelsey Paulus, also known as the Chickenlandia Presidential Advisor. Thank you to Talking to Crows for editing this episode and to Double M Ranch for their wonderful podcast art. If you enjoyed this podcast, please remember to rate and review it. You can give it a like here on th- on YouTube. You can review it on Spotify or on uh, Apple Podcasts or wherever you're listening to your podcast. But the number one thing I want you to do above all else is remember that you are always welcome in Chickenlandia. (laughs) Bye. Thanks, guys.